Are you tired of only hearing about lenses that cost thousands of dollars? Then you find this f11 800 mm lens and this 100 to 400 mm lens quite interesting. They offer good performance at very affordable price points. However, can they perform in the field or are they too handicapped by their slow apertures? Let's find out. The first word that pops into my mind when I think about the RF 800mm lens is fun. But it's simply so easy and enjoyable to use. Where else can you get 1280mm effective focal length for under $2500 and less than 4 pounds or 1.9 kilos? The flexibility that the 800mm lens may lack I get from its perfect sidekick the RF 100-400mm lens which clocks in at just 1.4 pounds or 649 grams and costs just 649 US dollars. The 800mm lens is fantastic when you're shooting further away subjects or smaller subjects but with a minimum focusing distance of 20 feet or 6 meters you can quickly run into issues when you're having subjects more up close because you might not be able to focus. On the other hand, the minimum focusing distance of the RF 100 to 400 mm lens is just 88 centimeters or 2.9 feet. So you can attempt fantastic shots, even macro shots are possible with this lens. And that's why I think that the combination of the two works so well. One for the further away subjects and one for everything that's up close or like some wider sort of landscape shots, for instance. The design of the RF F11 800 mm lens is quite unique because it's a prime lens but you actually have to zoom it out and lock it into place to be able to use it in the field. While this takes a little bit of getting used to in the beginning, it helps to keep the lens shorter when you're storing it away in your backpack for instance and that's very welcome. While both of these lenses work with all Canon R series bodies, I was particularly intrigued to try them on the R7 because with its 1.6 crop factor and lightweight body I will get crazy reach that is yet still very hand holdable. And even the 100 to 400 mm lens on the R7 turns into an effective focal length of 160 to 640 mm. The first trip I made with these two lenses was into the Outback in Queensland. It was a little bit of a scouting trip and I really enjoyed having that 800 mm lens on the R7 just lying next to me in the car and whenever we went for a little walk to look at a new location I could just grab it and when I saw a bird or some other animal I could quickly take some shots. If I had that big 600 mm lens with me I would have likely left it in the car and missed some nice photos. So being able to just Grab this lightweight combo with still a lot of focal length was fantastic and helpful especially when scouting locations or just walking around. One evening we found this awesome little young red cap robin. It was hopping around between a few dead trees and I was able to get some shots. I was using the 800mm lens on the R7 so I had to bump up the ISO quite high to even maintain a half decent shutter speed but with the good image stabilization in the lens I was able to get some nice shots at just the 250th of a second and a high ISO. They might not be the sharpest shots in the world but they were more than usable and with my process and masterclass workflow I ended up with some very nice looking images I was quite happy with. With a tiny bird like this having 1280mm effective focal length was very helpful in getting it large enough in the frame. The next morning it was raining and quite dull but I spotted a few Australasian grebes on a little hot spring that was kind of flowing through our campsite so quickly snuck up to the edge of the river put the camera as low as possible basically touching the water looked at the rear screen on the back of the camera and then started to take some images. Being able to hold a 800 millimeter lens this easily and this close to the water was quite nice in getting those shots. It would have been much harder to get these shots with a bigger and heavier lens. And then from the corner of my eye I spotted a few birds that I had rarely photographed before black fronted dotterels. They're just running up and down the edge of the river so I snuck closer again put the camera as close to the ground as possible and shot away and I was able to get some nice images when they're coming a little bit closer to me. They were quite skittish but again with the 1280 millimeters I was able to get some nice frame filling images even from a larger distance. As you can see with this grebe or the dotterel the raw files already look quite good but to make your images truly stand out it's important that you learn image editing and this is where I would love to help you with my pro sets and masterclass. With my pro sets I allow you to get the perfect colors and a great starting point for the editing process with just one click and in my masterclass I teach you everything you need to know when it comes to image editing and making your images stand out like color correction, curves, layers, cloning, liquefying, everything you need to know in photo to get amazing results. So if that's of interest to you make sure to check this out down there in the description.
As you can see in the viewfinder footage, the biggest challenge with the f11 800mm lens is definitely the restricted focus area you're getting on most cameras. Instead of the whole viewfinder being available for autofocusing and you being able to move the autofocusing points everywhere, you're restricted to usually a smaller square in the center of the viewfinder. So that makes it definitely harder to work with it in the field. You can get used to it and it's usable, but it's definitely harder for birds in flight, for instance, or with the grips or dotterels. I sometimes ended up with quite sort of wacky compositions because I had to try and keep the bird in the center of the frame and actually had to move the camera up for the overall focusing points to be able to stay on the bird's head. So it's definitely something that is not ideal. Let's talk about the big elephant in the room, the fixed f11 aperture. Is it a deal breaker or not? Personally, I think you can definitely work with it, but it's more challenging, especially in darker environments. Most of the time you'll end up shooting with pretty high ISO, even in good light, and I've hardly ever shot below ISO 1600 with these lenses, and you will frequently shoot at 3200, 6400, or 12800 to maintain decent enough shutter speeds to get sharp images. What I find the most difficult is actually that the aperture is fixed at f11, so you can't change it at all, which is quite challenging for video work at times. One morning I spent on a local island where Pacific Golden Plovers spent their winter. They fly all the way from Siberia and Alaska to Australia and winter here in this weird housing estate. In the nice morning light with a beautiful golden background, which was actually a kayak on the other side of the shore, I got some fantastic images that were beautifully sharp with great details and not too much noise. So in this beautiful light, the R7 with the 800mm lens more than delivered. Towards the end of the day, it got a little bit more cloudy and I felt a bit more adventurous. So I actually used the 800mm lens with a teleconverter on the R7 and got a few headshots of this bird that were still nice and sharp and detailed. Compared to the more low light photos, the shots taken in sunlight with the 800mm lens definitely have better sharpness and details, which is to be expected, I suppose. Now I've talked about the 800mm lens so much, but what about the 100 to 400mm lens? That's actually the lens that surprised me the most because it's so lightweight, great image stabilization and super sharp. It's just a fantastic little lens. The backgrounds may not be as smooth as some other lenses, but overall the image quality is simply outstanding and the lens being so small and light makes it just a joy to use. I love going to a local park with a lot of different waterfowls and this is where the 100 to 400 truly shined on the R7, allowing me to capture some wider shots, some head portraits like of these crazy looking magpie geese. The image stabilization on the 100 to 400 millimeter lens is also excellent and I could do low shutter speed shots or handheld video without problems, something that I really enjoyed. While 100 to 400 millimeters is sometimes short on a full frame camera, in combination with the R7 giving me 160 to 640 millimeters, I felt like I had a fantastic reach and it was able to get all the shots that I wanted in that situation. This is possibly also one of the lightest and cheapest ways to get to 600 millimeters with an R7 and 100 to 400 millimeter lens, and it's definitely handholdable for everyone. In the past, I've also used these lenses with the R5, and they've also given me excellent results. One of my favorite sessions was when I was living back in Melbourne with a group of gengen cockatoos that were feeding under low trees, and I was able to get some fantastic images with the R5 and R6 and the 800 millimeter lens. Like this beautiful portrait of the female feeding with some berries with the crest up. In the original RAW, there's a few rogue branches, but with my masterclass workflow that cleaned up very well and I got this final image that I was super happy with. And check out how nice and sharp it is as well. While the autofocus works quite well with the R7, it's definitely a little bit more consistent and more locked on with the R5 and the old R6. Where I struggled with the 800mm lens is birds in flight. First of all, 800mm is already a lot, but the autofocus isn't the fastest, it's a little bit inconsistent, and it's quite hard to just keep the birds within that small square, and whenever you get out of the square, the camera stops focusing. So for birds in flight, I didn't find the 800mm lens to be too good. You can definitely get some nice birds in flight shots, but the consistency just wasn't there for me. The 100 to 400 is a lot better in that regard and it stays more locked on and seems to have a slightly faster autofocus. In general, the autofocus of the 800mm lens is quite good and more than adequate. However, it does tend to jump off from time to time 
And this especially happens on the R7, whose autofocusing system also seems to have that tendency to sometimes jump on and off your subject. So the two combined will definitely give you some autofocus images. While I had the F11 800 and 100 to 400 millimeter lenses, I also got an R6 Mark II on loan from Canon. So of course, I used both of these lenses also with the R6 Mark II, not expecting much of a difference compared to other R5 or the R7, but this is where I was very wrong. On the R6 Mark II, both of these lenses rose to a whole nother level. Simply everything was better. I had a wider autofocusing box, I had faster autofocus, sharper files, more details, and better image stabilization. So that was a huge positive surprise to me because both of these lenses truly shined on the R6 Mark II. So framing your subject and getting better composition improved a lot with the R6 Mark II and the overall files just look amazing. Check out all these details and sharpness in this photo for instance. Of course, what you're gaining in speed and image quality with the R6 Mark II compared to the R7 you're giving up in terms of reach. As you can see in this Kokobara example, the R6 Mark II has a lot less reach than the R7 with the 800mm lens. At the same time though, it delivers slightly better image quality and overall sharpness. Check out the diverse kind of images you can take with the R7, 100-400 and 800mm lens. All the way from a wide shot of the nest with 160mm to 640mm to 1280mm and then if you really want to go crazy you can put an extender on this 800mm lens giving you 2560mm on the R7 and a headshot from a super large distance away. So that's pretty cool isn't it? Now I would obviously not recommend using extenders on the 800mm lens or the 100-400mm lens for that matter mainly because they cost more than the lenses or pretty much the same but they do work in rare scenarios, but definitely not what you want to use on a regular basis. So will either of these lenses make it into my camera bag? At this stage, probably not, but every time I'm using the 800mm lens, I'm very tempted to actually buy one, simply because it's so much fun and easy to use. I can just have it with me in the car whenever I go for a walk and just grab it and have it with me and it doesn't weigh much and I can still get some nice images because I have that nice and large reach. Personally, to cover that sort of 100 to 500, 6, 700 millimeter range, I've decided to go with the excellent 100 to 500 millimeter lens. It has no autofocus restrictions, super fast focusing, and also amazing image quality, some of the best image quality I've ever seen in a zoom lens. So that lens covers all the bases for me and also with a 1.4 extender works quite well and gets me to that sort of 700 millimeter range. And you can even use sometimes a two times extender on it, giving you up to thousand millimeters and still some decent image quality. So for me, that's the better compromise also because I already have a big 600 millimeter prime lens, but at the same time, for that better performance, you're also paying a lot more for that 100 to 500 millimeter lens. The 100 to 500 millimeter lens alone costs as much as an R7 and the 800 millimeter lens together. And if you add the 1.4 extender, then that costs as much as the 100 to 400 millimeter lens. So basically, you get an R7, 100 to 400, and 800 millimeter lens for the same price of a 100 to 500 and a 1.4 extender, and then you still have to buy a camera body for it. So in terms of value for money, I think the F100 to 400 millimeter and F11 800 millimeter lenses offer amazing value. They're nice and lightweight, produce lovely images, and don't cost a fortune. What else could we want? What are your experiences with these lenses in the field? Are you using them? Have you used them? Or is it something you're looking into? And what's your experiences with the R7 on these lenses or some of the other camera bodies? Make sure to let me know in the comments. Also check out some of my other videos. Give me a thumbs up for this video and I will see you in my next video very soon. Bye guys. Oh, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. See ya.